still I'm I'm still working at my language and and uh these are these are the things, you know, when we look at ourselves and I look at myself. Perhaps perhaps I'm too comfortable in Western culture to put that effort that I should be into my own language. Um, so those are things I'm working at too. And uh, like, like many of us here perhaps, uh, I, I've been, since I was been home and been, been uh, at education myself, I was having a discussion about uh, what, is, what is it I'm researching and studying in school. And all it, all it is, is I'm working at Native Studies to study my language at the at the depth I couldn't do in other disciplines like education or law. Uh, but those are the things I was interested in, education and, and law. And those are the things we hear in a prayer this morning. Uh, Minigozi win, those sacred and natural gifts that Creator has, has given us. Um, you know, Akzoka Anak, you know. Yesterday we heard those thunderbirds, and you know I've, that's the first time I heard them this year. So it it really felt in me. To, it felt like a, a real change of seasons and uh, a time to soon be gathering around a tree, a earning lodge, uh, our our teaching lodge. My uncle was talking about talking about th these things that we should be balancing out with our own education practices. We put so much emphasis on Western education, but we should be doing some of these things. Remember yesterday I talked about heritage? We were talking... So yesterday one person come talk to me about a place, heritage. There's a place here in Manitoba where there's imprints in the rock... Of a, of a handprint, imprints of a knife, imprints of a, where spirit sat. And those, 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 thing, those, those places are important to us because when we think about heritage, those are the things that we inherit. You know, we were talking about Zach Whitecloud was in the media, was in the news. There's a lot going on about uh, the name calling that's been going on. And, you know, we had our uh, chief, Wayne Jarlis, remind us yesterday that those things just didn't happen yesterday. They've been happening for a, a long time. But heritage are those things that we, in, we inherit. And, you know, my argument is still, you know, heritage. Where's all our artifacts? Where's all these things? Well, one of the trivia questions we had a couple of weeks ago is there's 400,000 artifacts in the Manitoba Museum, in, in Regina, all these museums all over the place. That's where all our artifacts are. And perhaps if we shifted our department name, language, heritage, and cultures, or, you know, we can make a better argument for to have these artifacts back and to, and to uh, have these spaces for that. But, um, yeah, I just want to thank my Uncle Wally for the guidance this morning for opening the day in that way and to remind us that these are our lodges that should be going hand in hand with our education process. We have our teach. There was that place in uh, Black River. They... The story, as I can remember, Mongo telling me, was that there was ribbons, cloth that came down, and th there was a knife that was used, cut 44 laws, and these laws are represented when we build that teaching lodge, those 44 poles, but these, are, these all have different things to them. There's a teaching lodge, like that Medewin lodge, there's an action lodge, whether it be a round dance lodge, powwow lodge, and there's uh, the earning lodge, sun dance lodge. So, 
And that's where we earn that knowledge that we 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 uh, we seek to to uh, live our lives for mino bimadizuin. So that's that's what I think a little bit. I still think I still like that discussion about uh, heritage. That we have too many things in the in the museum, and uh, we could uh, we could we could have these as part of showing what's part of an education process for for uh, our children because uh, those are you know yesterday I was also reading Namawan's drum it's about it's about um it's about a uh, Pongasi area and those that drum is in the museum but Thunderbirds have always helped that chief Namawan those were his his helpers, and he would call on him, and he, there was a, a image of a thunderbird that would sit at the lodge there too. And it was the late Roger Roulette from Sandy Bay, who was helping Maureen Matthews with that book. But but one of the coolest things that she said about uh, fog when we see that fog a uh, one in the morning, that's when we know. Those Atazokanak, those spirits are close by. And he mentioned Gichiganebik, those serpents. Those uh, serpents that are in the water, uh, water bodies, are close by when we see that fog. And so it was, it was nice to hear the, it was nice to hear the Thunderbirds yesterday and to, to think about those things because Manitou, Manitoba, Roger Roulette also defines that word as where the spirit exists. And there's a lot of those places around us and close to our communities. So with that, um, we're going to go into a little movie, uh, the Wabang movie, how it uh, talks about Talks about a lot of these things that began 50 years ago with plenty, a lot of our leadership. So uh, we'll we'll move into that movie, and then you know what? On our agenda here, we're gonna have a little change to our agenda. We're gonna move up our our guest speaker about 15 minutes today to about 9:45. So we'll after the after the movie, we'll we'll move on with the recap of day one. Last thing I want to conclude with today is today is trivia day. We're going to have prizes. So the first trivia question, and the first person that can get it right, uh, the, the first person that gets it right gets a shirt. So what is Canada's original sport? Oh, I, too many people. <laughs> that was too easy, too. How am I going to solve that? I didn't, I didn't think it. How about this one? One more. And I, only, I need to see a hand up. Three. That, that one was an easy one. The stick is right here. That, that was a gimme. But so the next one. Put your hand up. And whoever I point to will name three NHL players of indigenous who are indigenous. I seen a shirt with the yellow, the black shirt with the orange tag was the first hand I saw at that table over there. Who's got that orange lanyard? Yep. Who's, who, who, so who are these uh, three players? Okay, you know, uh, I should have said active NHL players, but I'll give you that. I'm getting warmed up myself, so excellent. So come on up and come and select your T-shirt. So we'll, we'll start with uh, trivia, um, the, the film, and we'll proceed with the day. Thank you. Wabang. 
is a position paper or policy paper of the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood that was uh, written in 1971. Um, and it's a statement by the chiefs of Manitoba on what they wanted in economic development, community development, health, um, education, and so forth. It was meant as a, a seminal document that was going to guide people's thinking um, over the years ahead. And also, uh, it was needed as a, a policy document from one level of government to another, meaning Indian government, as, as that was the terminology of the time, Indian government to um, mostly the federal government. Well, the impact it had was to actually preserve our status as uh, First Nation people. Wabang was a very significant part of our history, you know, where our people were in a time of resurgence. Our people were struggling to break free. That's why the position paper of Wabang is so important to remember because it's, it's our history that was written by ourselves. So Wabang, you know, in the 60s, through that actual participation of, of the community, the people and the leaders, it's a very significant document. So to think of a, you know, a specific vision at that time, there was a hope and there was a, almost like a, a dream that things were had to improve, things had to change, and things have changed. On October the 7th, 1971, the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood, representing 54 bands of Manitoba Indians, presented their position paper, named Wabong, to the Minister of Indian Affairs and Northern Development, the Honorable Jean Chrétien. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Briere. I was uh, Jocelyn Wilson at that time. I was the uh, acting director of consultations and negotiations. Uh, while we were working on the paper and towards the almost completion, Dave uh, Cushane, the president of the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood, called us into his office. We brainstormed. He facilitated the brainstorming, and that's how we came up with Wabang. The position paper has been called Wabang. Wabang means our tomorrow. And this is for us to look into the future of what the Indians of Manitoba, the Indian tribes of Manitoba wish to happen in this province. I'm Janet Fontaine, Janet Spence Fontaine, and I um, worked on Wabang, um, pulling together the, the health section of that document. So the vision of Wabang, um, some of the time it was just to get this done because we knew that it was important. We knew it was going to be presented to the prime minister and we knew that we had to be on top of our, of our subject areas. I just had this feeling, okay, we'll, we'll all do our best right now. And that's what everyone did. We just worked to the best of our knowledge and ability. And so I had been a teacher, I had been a principal, I had been a guidance counselor, I'd been a supervisor of schools, you know. And, uh, and so with all this uh, background and experience, I felt that I did want to have something to do with a policy that was going to affect education for our people, you know. So that was how I ended up uh, the, the key person to work on the education part. You know, I use a, a number of statistics in, in my report, for example, that shows that uh, at least 90% of our students were not graduating uh, from grade 12. And that is, uh, I mean, scandalous even, <laughs> I mean, at that time, you know, to have that. And, uh, and this was, um, I, I like to point out the fact that Indian Affairs was running these schools and that's their record. 90% of dropout rate, you know, so something was wrong there. You know, the document of, of Wabung deserves, you know, to be heard 
I'm known as uh, Dave Kushain, the son of the late uh, Grand Chief Dave Kushain. And Wabang certainly became, a, you know, the, the voice of the people as it was expressed within the document. And the other thing that I feel that uh, that is absolutely important, which which applies just as much today, is that those leaders at that time in the 60s, and certainly my father was 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 one of the, the prominent leaders of that time, is that what they did is they opened the door for us to reclaim our identity as a people. In 1969, when the white paper was drafted by the by Trudeau's government at the time, and John Chrétien was the Indian Affairs Minister. Indigenous people across Turtle Island rejected it resoundingly. The primary reason for rejecting the 1969 white paper at the time was because there was no legal foundation upon which Indigenous people could find themselves and sustain themselves outside of the Indian Act and outside of treaties. And the, the, the idea around the 1969 white paper to remove treaties, to remove the distinct legal status of indigenous people would have left indigenous people within a vast ocean of, of, of colonial law, uh, an, an ocean of laws that, that uh, did not apply and did not take into context the unique history of who we are as original people. It would have had the effect of terminating Indian rights and um, that, that was not acceptable. So all of the organizations, all of the Indian organizations across Canada did a thinking person's paper of how they would want the future to look as a government to government um, effort. The position paper is a culmination of the, of the discussion and consultation that have taken place the last year with 54 bands in Manitoba. There was also the research that we had done, of the historical development uh, and what had taken place over the last 100 years, and showing what the conditions are today as far as the Indian community is concerned. There is statistical background there to support the conditions that we outline in the present situation. But most important of all, it contains a direction in which the Indian people would like to participate in their own country. It may have seemed like it was in reaction to a, a government document, but it was more than that. It was really a time of um, self-determination. Um, it, was, it was generally a time of rethinking where we were and wanting a different, better relationship with, uh, with government. The Indian people of Manitoba are not playing games. And this paper that we have presented to you today is not a political ploy. The 1969 white paper, however, uh, was, a, I believe, a, an attempt to, um, to eradicate you know, certain recognitions that are due uh, to Indigenous people. And in that light, we, we needed to take a position as the original people to articulate ourselves, not from within the spheres of our own political, uh, political groupings, but externally. We needed to articulate in English and in some cases French how we felt about uh, what the initiatives of the federal government was at the time. And to that end, we created Wabung here in Manitoba. Wabung was a reflection of the foundational principles of how we operate our governance within the, the newly developing Canadian political landscape that was here. And since then, many of our people reflect upon Wabung as a foundational document, which guides us even today. And it all stems back to Wabung. You know, you just, we can't take these things lightly because it, it was the thrust. It was what woke up a lot of people to a lot of things, especially the, the governments in, in a sense, even though they didn't say, okay, okay, here's, here's all the help we can give you, but at least they understood, and then we could try to negotiate. And our paper is a paper of cooperation. It makes reasonable recommendations. And it was written with the attitude that the government is prepared to cooperate. And therefore, we are too. So we worked hard at the at rivers to get the document ready, the golden document ready for presentation to Prechien. And uh, 
work late into the night and late in, and early next morning just to be sure that it, uh, it was ready. For your information, our staff had to work till six o'clock this morning. Our Xerox broke down and a number of other things developed as well. Yes, I, I did attend the presentation at Rivers, but yes, there were, were a number of meetings and they were large and there was discussion. Um, uh, people were very good about receiving the information. In his reply, the Honorable Jean Cartien thanked Chief Dave Cochin and officials from the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood for the well-researched and clearly presented position paper of the Indian people in Manitoba. We have very good organization, and I must say, probably the best one is the Manitoba one. Every touch burned. Over 50? Ask a doctor about preventing shingles with Shingrix. And when you come with a presentation like this one, I'm glad to accept this before the Canadian government. Who will study that? I hope that we will bring action as fast as possible. So we didn't receive a formal response from the government. That was totally unacceptable, totally unexpected, and absolutely shameful. That, that was just, um, even now, looking back, I'm thinking, how was that possible that they would not have respect, not just the document itself and, and the information in it, but how could they disrespect like the first people of, of Manitoba? What did I think when there's no response from the government? I suppose we're quite used to that, you know, we put a lot of effort into uh, stating our uh, positions on things. And at that time, there may not have been an official response, but there was definitely an impact. So it, it wasn't all lost and the impact was really rather great. The most important thing was to have some control of our education, take control of our education. The efforts were um, next put into education. And that, that was a very worthwhile effort because it was a, a practical solution um, to a, a really important underlying topic. A lot has changed and uh, there was more uh, cooperation and uh, working together with the Indian Affairs in the, the region, the Manitoba region, they seem to extend themselves to try and work with, with Dave uh, more, uh, more than they had before. Well, Dave really believed in the grassroots and he, he was that kind of person to try to ensure that he was hearing the right things and he saw a different relationship whereby it wouldn't be a relationship of dependency. And uh, he was a very effective um, leader and politician. And where the hell has been the Canadian people as a whole? All Canadian people to let this thing go so far and so long to see generation after generation of people being destroyed. You know, I, uh, I remember, you know, the, the toughness of, of my father. And I, and I, sometimes I believed he was too hard on me. And then, you know, through the compassion and the kindness of my mother, she would tell me, she said, uh, dad knows what he's doing. She says, one day you're going to, you're going to remember why your father was so tough. In my journey with him during his political career, no matter where he went and as I traveled with him, he never, never overstepped the elders. That he would, that Those were the ones that he went to first. He talked to them, he laughed with them, you know, and the elders was where the knowledge was and he knew it. He knew where the knowledge was and it was within the elders. You have before you description, detailed, documented descriptions of the conditions in which we live. They need no elaboration by me 
for they are devastating. A devastating indictment of the Canadian society, of the Canadian people as a whole, of their institutions, of all their institutions, of Canada before the world. He provided leadership in so many ways. He really was such a great facilitator for getting the job done and gathering his team together. We were working on Wabung. Even then, there were six of us women who were in charge of areas. Another person was in health, another was in community development, another one in uh, social development and education. So even back in 71, we were called upon to take on these important roles. At the time, I was a bit of a radical, and uh, I made sure that I was treated on an equal basis. I guess I was a little bit aggressive in that area in terms of uh, being a woman in a, in a man's world, it seemed. And of course, we had Janet Fontaine and uh, Verna Kirkness. They weren't meek women, put it that way. <laughs> Maybe look at uh, people like Jean Folster, uh, who uh, was the leader of her people many, many years ago. She did represent one of the biggest uh, tribes in Manitoba. And one of our evidences of such progress is that for the first time we have an Indian woman as a chief. And to present the cultural aspect of our feeling, I would like to call on Mrs. Jean Foster, Chief of Norway House Band, to present our views on behalf of the Manitoba Indians. It just brings a smile to my face now to think of, of Jean Foster and her coming into power. It, it was a reflection of the wisdom of the community, I, I think. When you look back on it, you realize that the, the women who, who contributed to Wabang were many, and I'm thinking of, of some of, of the women without whom it would have been totally impossible to get this job done, who were in the support positions. Um, they, they kept the organization rolling. We were uh, more than capable of holding up our half of the sky. The, the women have always had the, a leading role in, in our lives. And I think that's the acknowledgement that they need to, they need to be, that they need to receive, you know, is how well that they took care of us. And in the development of, of, the, of, of Wabang, you know, the spirit of the voice of women is very, very much a part of it. The women carry something, you know, that is added, I think, in terms of uh, having more strength. In, in their voice, which is the voice of, of the love of the child. Um, I had the feeling that, okay, if, if this is all right, it's going, to, it's going to last and it's going to be relevant to our lives now and, and in the future. But I really can't say that I was thinking that it would be completely relevant today. I'm just thrilled that it stood the test of time. There is importance to the document today in terms of how we express ourselves to the external community. We can focus less on Wabung because it is our external document. It is for world consumption. It is for public consumption. Whereas internally we have our own politics, which is often informed by our attachments to our language, our traditions, our customs and our ceremonies. What we're doing now is we belong in the movement to continue to have more self-determination in the era of truth and reconciliation, be able to go beyond Wabag. You will find the spirit of the people within that document. And that spirit is to, to reclaim our right of identity as a people. What's important is that, uh, is that we must find the courage to take full responsibility in determining our own self-determination as a people. You should know your language and unfortunately because of residential schools um, that cycle was broken. You can't um, 
just say you're Indian, which is what I heard for a long, long time. But you must know if you're Cree, if you're uh, Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, or, you know, Dene, or Dakota, or whatever. You, you should know. If you know who you are, if you pretend to be something else that you're not, or you don't know, I mean, how... How can you be a strong person? I see a day when when we can wipe out the disparity so that we are not stuck in poverty. Our tomorrows are today as well. Wabam really opened that door, you know, to create these opportunities for us, you know, to come forward, to be the real leaders. And I think by just by, you know, knowing and understanding that part of history that you know, when the document was, was developed and written, that it applies just as much today as it did at that time. Wabang, to me, is uh, encouraging us to go back to the beginning and to remember who we are, to remember our creation stories, to remember the duties and the responsibilities that we were given, you know, how to be a good people, how to be a strong people, and how to be a spiritual people. So, a lot, of, a lot to think about in that video, and good to see faces that are no longer here, but, um, so we have a, a busy day upcoming. We are going to, we're going to start in about uh, 10 minutes. I had a, uh, I had a reminder to, uh, to to uh, mention there was a draw in one of the sessions yesterday and somebody didn't come and get their prize. So if there's a Kim Campbell in the audience, you come and see me at the table and I'll direct you to the lady to see. Okay. Um, you know what, we're gonna move on with the next trivia question. How many female chiefs are there in Manitoba? I'm looking for a hand. I see a hand there. Blue. I can't hear you. Put stand up. Stand up. Blue. Yeah, blue Knit lanyard. Close. I see right there. Close. I, hand over there. How many? Four. Close. I see a hand right there. Close. Close. Yes? Close. Close. I see a hand up over there. Close. Okay, Quebec Nordique's hat. How much? Close. Hat. How much? Close. You know what? Okay, hand right there. Close. I see another hand right there with the white. Yep. You with the red shirt. I mean, at the table. I see you looking around. Not 14. Close. I see a blue shirt. Hand up. 15. Close. <laughs> Orange shirt in the front here. Close. That was said about a couple of times. Yep. 15. Close. You're st standing up in the, with the plaid shirt. 
Close. <laughs> Red shirt. Close. <laughs> I see a hand, right? the shades on. How many? 13? Close. Standing up with the blue lanyard, pink shirt. Two? Close. Not quite. Purple shirt. <laughs> Somebody said 62 because of the wives. No? <laughs> All the women are chiefs. Good analogy, but not the answer. <laughs> Blue shirt. 19. That's a little high. Nope, but close. Um, muscle shirt. Yep. How many? Eight? Is that what you said? Close. Sorry. Frank? Huh? Seven? Close. Nope. 62? It's a little high. Not that high. <laughs> okay. Right there at the table. White shirt and beside you. Close. Over there, the black hat behind the cook. How many? Good answer, but no shirt. <laughs> I see your hand waving gray sweater. Six. Not quite. Green green shirt. Green white. How much? You say ten? Not quite. Close. Yellow or dress? That's the correct answer right there. Eleven. <laughs> I don't have all the communities though, I'd, but it's Kathy Merrick, there's in Long Plains, Kyra Wilson, there's in Sioux Valley, I mean uh, Chinupa, Lola, Thunderchild, Chief Lola. What's that? You, who said 11 over there? Well, you, you know what, you can come up here too, I've got another shirt, because I'm not, but we got, we got two winners on this one, so that's it. Title. And uh, there's a few more communities. Uh, one of the speakers that was that was uh, making some comments on behalf of MKO, Chief of Bunnaby First Nation as well. So, okay, hold on. Okay, what time is it here? We got a few more minutes before before uh, our our guest speaker. So I'm thinking of a next trivia question. Who was he was in the first half of the century, 1900 to 1950, he was widely considered the greatest athlete. Who, who is, who am I talking about? Who? You got it, Jim Thorpe. Jim Thorpe was excellent at every sport he played at. Uh, he, he also, he was also stripped of his gold medal at a, uh, uh, because he played some professional baseball. So come on up and collect your shirt. I have one more question. In 1992, from a community here in Manitoba, she won a, gold, she won a bronze medal at the 1992 Olympics. 
Who who is this lady and what reserve is she from? I'm looking for a blue shirt over there. Angela Chalmers is correct. Come on up. Come on up for your other shirt too, your your Jim Thorpe their shirt. Okay, so just a little recap of yesterday. I'm hearing all the sessions went well. Um, sessions went well. That we had uh, a lot of a lot of people and a lot of moving parts going on yesterday, but we got through the day well. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, we have an equal amount of sessions to go to. So yesterday we had Dr. Courtney Leary as our keynote speaker. And I always enjoy hearing about someone's journey in pushing inconsistent, like consistent with the theme of our conference, breaking through to excellence. That's that's what she's done with uh, in her in her medicine and her practice. So it's great to see that. Uh, I'm gonna have my uh, coworker introduce the next. Um, the next, uh, our next keynote speaker here shortly, but uh, <clears throat> I wanted to mention that uh, I wanted to mention that uh, we're going to have a keynote speaker here again, and we want to keep we want to keep it uh, at a at a nice quiet level for people to to hear what's going on and to catch the message of our speaker. You know. Uh, if you feel like visiting, you can go and have some coffee and some snacks in the lobby. But we want to use this space to give that opportunity to our guest speaker today. So we we'll encourage you to visit and socialize. We got a great trade show in the back. It's always good to support uh, our own First Nation businesses as well. A lot of nice stuff over there. You know what? I was just thinking about things, about culture of support. You know, a lot of communities have a lot of, they support each other in, in places. If you go, if you look around in China, Chinatown, for example, the, there's a network of people supporting businesses. Same with, same with um, the Italians, for example. They'll support each other's businesses. And we have 70, 80,000 First Nations people in Manitoba and not a lot of storefronts, so. Uh, but that time is going to be coming soon, you know. Capion Barracks is going to bring in a whole new change. It's going to change our, our our whole our whole perspective on the city. So, so with that, you know, um, I encourage you to check the trade show out and support our 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 business businesses over there. Um, give me one sec. All right, I just want to reiterate uh, what Jason was saying about being quiet. Uh, we have some elders in here, and uh, you know, the further away you get away from the speakers, the harder it is for them to hear. Now, I'm going to try a little trick. You guys might know it. Uh, I was told this by a teacher. <clears throat> I'm going to drop a pin, and I want to hear it. So I'm going to wait until I can hear this pin drop. I was told this was an old teacher's trick, so you're supposed to all know it. Shh. <sighs> quiet. Okay, so quiet. All right, thank you so much. Let's keep it this way for the keynote speaker, please. If you're going to visit, go visit. Okay, <laughs> you can go ahead, brother. Okay, so for our next... Uh... 
We're gonna we're gonna call to the stage Emil Easter. You know, Emil is a member of Chamawan Cree Nation in Northern Man Manitoba. When he was just when he was just a few months old, a case of meningitis resulted in Esther losing his hearing. So he spent his childhood growing up in Winnipeg so he could attend the Manitoba School for the Deaf. Easter graduated from MSD and held various jobs before attending North Central University in Minneapolis for his Bachelor of Arts degree. For the past six years, Easter has been working at the Resource Center helping students who are deaf. His favorite parts of the job are traveling to the various First Nations, engaging with the youth, and providing instruction in American Sign Language. So with that, I'd like to call uh, our keynote speaker to the, to the stage and, and uh, to provide today's keynote. All right, well, hello everyone out there. Uh, so I'm not used to a crowd this large, this, this big in gathering. I have done somewhere between 300, 400. I've done one up to 500 in the past, but this is triple the size. So it's a little bit staggering to see everyone here and me being on the stage. So you may see my legs start to shake a little bit. Um, but uh, you know, again, I know that Michael had asked everyone to be quiet so we could hear a pin drop. That doesn't affect me. Being a deaf person, you can be as loud as you want, honestly. I'm not going to hear it, so the pin drop doesn't need to work for me. So I, I do want to introduce a couple people who are here uh, supporting me. So I have my wife who's in the room at the front. Um, she is deaf as well. Uh, she's got blue eyes, blonde hair, and she's from Finland. Uh, we met at the university in Minneapolis at uh, North Central, and uh, we fell in love there, and she stole my heart. And ever since then, we've been sweethearts, and we've been married and uh, got engaged. Uh, and it was a very short engagement. Uh, it was great. Um, there was, of course, rough times. Two streams flowing, right, merging, getting together, trying to figure out how everything works to become this beautiful river, and we've made it work. We do have six beautiful children, uh, four girls, and I have two boys. Um, none of them are deaf. They are all hearing. So it's just myself and Barbara, my wife, the mother of our children who are deaf, who sign, and all of our kids have ASL as their first language as well. And so this is our beautiful family that we have. Thank you, thank you. So next. So I'd like to talk a little bit about my journey uh, growing up. Next slide. So I thought the first thing that I would do is go through and teach a few folks in the room, well, everybody in the room, hopefully a couple of signs. So I want you all to copy me. Of course, I'm not forcing you to learn sign language, but I thought if you would be interested, here are a couple of signs that you could use, and it doesn't matter. This is just practice. At some point in time, you guys will be as fluent as me, but here's the first sign. Everybody copy me. This is a sign for hello. Hello. Super simple. Very easy. If you're saying hi to somebody, you can say hi. If you're saying hello to many people, you can use it over and over again. Next slide. So we're going to say, how are you? So how are you? How are you? How are you? Wow, look at this. This is a great class. How are you? You could say to kids that you're working with or adults in the community. Next one. This would be your response. I'm fine. I'm fine. And the other one is good. I'm doing good. I'm doing well. Good. If you're greeting someone in the morning, good morning. So good morning. Wow, you guys are fantastic. This is a great class. Excellent. Everybody's practicing sign. I see all those hands out there. It's very easy. It's very basic. 
So you can say good morning. You can give the thumbs up. It's very kind of universal, but you can say good morning to someone. Hello. These are all very simple things you can do just to start that conversation with somebody that you may have in your community who's deaf or hard of hearing. So next one would be nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, so it's nice to meet you. Nice to have the elders in the room. It's nice to have everybody. There's some strange faces, some familiar faces out there. So it's nice to have everybody here joining us today. So you may already know this. They uh, mentioned this at the beginning. Uh, this is where I'm from. This is my home. And my sign name, just so you know, culturally we have sign names in the deaf culture. So mine is E by the side of my head and back just because of the way I style my hair. So that's my sign name for Emil. Next slide. So at the age of one to two months, I became ill. And they had mentioned that in my introduction as well, that uh, of course, being a baby, I wouldn't realize this or notice that uh, I had hearing. So I don't have any previous experience having some hearing, being able to speak uh, when I was young. I never had that. My ears, as, long, as far as I know, has, have never worked. I've been deaf, culturally deaf, all my life. And of course, for the first few years, I wasn't exposed to ASL, no American Sign Language. That only started in my life when I was five or six years old, where I started to learn. And that was at the Manitoba School for the Deaf, where I started to sign, where I started to learn some vocabulary, and then became fluent later on. I do have parents, obviously, and brothers and sisters that are within the community. And of course, they wanted me at that time to go see a medicine man. And so my sister had been ill and she sat there and I had asked another uh, sibling in my family what they were doing. And the medicine man was with my sister and doing the rituals and the ceremonies, the pipe ceremonies in order to heal her of her sickness. And I was like, okay, I was watching and I was intrigued and I thought, well, this is very theatrical. I wasn't quite sure what was going on here. And then at some point they had said, it's your turn. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to go. I don't want to see the medicine man. But I did. I sat there and he was speaking to me. And of course, I couldn't hear what he was saying. And he was starting to do some of the ceremony and the, the ritual as well. And I was kind of laughing, I'll have to admit, because I didn't think that anything was going to happen. And then to my surprise, I started feeling this this sensation in my body, this tingling, this tingling within my ears even, where I thought I was actually going to become hearing, non-deaf. I, I really started to believe that this was going to happen. And then when I, the feeling went away, it was just who I was. It was, you know, I, I wasn't able to hear and I was a little bit disappointed, honestly. And so were my parents. I could see that they wanted me to be hearing and so they took me to another place in the northern communities in a reserve as well, where there was another medicine man. And then they took me to another place where there was another medicine man. And so we had tried two, three times to perform these ceremonies. And at that time, I felt like it was enough. And they wanted me to go to a church and see if there was an opportunity for them to pray over my hearing that potentially would come back to me as well. And I just didn't want to do it anymore. That, that was who I was. I was a deaf person here on earth and that's how the creator made me and i needed to accept that and i didn't need to change who i was and i didn't need to go to places to feel like i needed to change who i was that i could be comfortable in this body the one that the creator gave me and proud a proud deaf man and i didn't want to have to worry i mean Life here on earth is very short. The creator has another place for us as well where there aren't any types of sicknesses and diseases or hearing or non-deaf or deaf people. So I didn't need to worry about that. Life here on earth is too short to worry about those things. Next. Next. 
So some of you may be familiar with this bus, the Grey Goose Lines, which is no longer here, but in Easterville, again, my family, my, you know, we would come together. And my parents had said that, you know, when I came back from school, that they would again take care of me, that my parents would be there. And again, there was a lot of confusion because I would have to go from place to place. And that was Winnipeg back to Easterville all the time. And of course, in Easterville, there was no ASL. So there were barriers. And again, I didn't have my parents when I was in Winnipeg either. So I'd be all alone traveling back and forth and nobody to communicate with. And so I had to learn on my own how to travel back and forth, how to make my way through in Winnipeg at the school for the deaf. And if you go back to that image again of the Grey Goose bus, again, my parents would come and pick me up, but you have to remember, I would be dropped off on Highway 6 and 60, and I would have to make my way on my own at such a young age, and I was fearful. I didn't want to go, and my parents had said, you have to go. You have to go to W, and of course, I knew that meant Winnipeg, that I had to go there, but that's how they communicated with me, and it was just with gesture, and that's how we communicated, and of course, I cried, and I cried, and I didn't want to go. I told them that I didn't want to go there, and they had said that I had to go to school. They would say, you know, gesturing again that, you know, writing on a piece of pen and paper, you have to go. And I didn't want to. I wanted to stay home. I wanted to stay in Chimavawan. I didn't want to leave my family. But of course, I got on the bus and I made that trip. It was five to six hours. I would cry all the way there. And the bus driver would tell me that I would need to be quiet. But I was young and I was crying and I was looking out the window and seeing the land pass me by as I made my way into the city. And I didn't have money. I didn't have food. I didn't have anything to drink. And that was for the full five hours until I got there. And then my foster family would come and they would pick me up and they would bring me into the house. And it was a white family and I didn't know what to do. And so they brought me into the home and they would bathe me right away. And it was dirty. I don't remember ever seeing water that dirty. It was brown. They would use nicks. Some of you remember that. It was for getting lice out of your hair. It smelled awful. And so they would scrub me down as soon as I came into the city and they would be aggressive with me and it would be cutting my hair as soon as I got back again from the summer break and I didn't say anything and I didn't know what to say and there they were bathing me and scrubbing me and the brown water would flow off my body and down into the tub and then they would put me into a bed with brand new pajamas and this this was supposed to be my new home but there was no connection to home there was no sign language. There was no way to communicate. I didn't have family there. And the next day I would have to go to school. I'd have to go to the Manitoba School for the Deaf. And I didn't know what that was. And I didn't know what it was going to be like to learn. And I'd be there for 10 months on my own. And the only time I'd get to go back home again was during Christmas break and maybe spring break and over the two months of the summer break. And that would be the only time and the rest of the time I would be forced to stay in Winnipeg. And so that was one of the biggest challenges for me growing up. And I had parents, of course, and, but the foster parents, they didn't do anything with me. They would put me into the basement during the time that I was back in the foster home. And I'd be sitting there and I'd have TV, but of course, no closed captioning. Right, Everybody else was laughing, but I wouldn't know what was going on. I would ask to see, hey, what's happening on the TV? But I wouldn't know. This is 1980s. I didn't know what was going on. You know, I'd want to go out and play, and everybody else was on the, the playground, on the swing sets, and they were playing. And again, it wasn't just me. There was five or six individuals from around those communities that would have to go. But everybody else was hearing. Everybody else was going to mainstream schooling. But there were only two of us who were deaf on that bus ride there. And so we needed to support each other because we didn't know any better. And so if I wanted to come home or if I wanted to go upstairs, you know, I would, I would hear people. 
when I was at, at the foster home, I didn't know how loud I was being. I was stomping around, apparently. I was slamming doors. I was chewing loudly. They kept telling me, you're chewing loudly. You need to be quiet. But of course, I don't know that. I can't hear it. So they would tell me to be quiet constantly. Walk quieter. Eat with your mouth closed. Do it our way. So I would tiptoe around thinking that was the best thing to do. That was the best way to get around without upsetting anybody. Closing the doors quietly getting into the bed, trying not to make a sound, holding all these things in. And then when I went to Eastervelle, I was so excited because I didn't have to worry about that anymore. I felt like I was owed those times, those months that I wasn't able to be around. I would be able to go out for swims in the community. I didn't have to worry about getting bathed. I didn't have to worry about getting my hair cut. I'd be able to go out onto the boat, onto the, onto the boat to fish, to hunt with my family. And then again, those, those months would end and I would be right back at it again, crying on my five hour bus ride, thinking about the 10 months that I would have to spend there in that community, the foster home again, with mean foster parents forcing me to do those things. And I didn't want to go, I didn't want to go. And I saw that gray bus line bus pulling up again. And you know, at times I was thinking maybe it would break down. Maybe I wouldn't have to go. Maybe this time I could stay back. But for 11 to 12 years, I'd have to go and I wasn't able to stay. And I, and I didn't know who my community was. I was losing it. I wasn't being exposed to the Cree language of my community. I wanted to be exposed. I wanted to be a part of the culture, the language, the religion. The, the, the rituals and the traditions that we have, but I didn't have those opportunities. I'd have to go to the Winnipeg Manitoba School for the Deaf and I didn't know why. And only those few times I'd be able to go home. But I felt like I had two homes. I'd have to go back. I'd have to you know, go through two cultures. I'd be able to go to one culture and have that experience. And then I'd have to leave two months later, later and go to another culture and, and immerse myself in that culture again but I felt like I was owed my Cree language, my Cree culture, because I would miss so much of that. And I didn't want to go and I didn't realize the reasons why I'd have to go. But again, that was just a part of my life. And so that was that, that, that dichotomy that I'd have to go through trying to figure out who I was as an individual. And again, shuffling my feet to walk. And every time I'd come back again, I was told that I was dumb. I was told in sign language that you're dumb, that you're being too loud. And I was being abused in that foster home. And I was terrified, terrified to go back. I wasn't confident. I didn't know who to tell. I just had to keep that all in, keep it all to myself. And then at the age of 12, I made the decision that I was no longer going to go. I told my family, that's it. I'm done. I'm staying home. I'm not leaving Chimawawin again. And I felt like that was it. That would be alleviate all that stress. I didn't have to deal with it anymore. And then of course that was in spring and then fall would come and my family would say, no, you have to go back now. And my sister said, you can come with me. And you said, you can come live with me. So again, she drove me and I didn't want to go back, but it made it easier going back with my sister that time. Next. So this is the Manitoba School for the Deaf. This is the school I was speaking of. So when my sister had passed away, um, that would be on the next slide. But if, I, if I'm talking about Manitoba School for the Deaf, this is where I, I'd, I'd be able to learn part of my deaf culture. I stayed there. That was the residency I was able to stay at the dorm. And for those six years, life became better. Next. And when I spoke about being able to go back with my sister, my sister Grace, that was a different experience altogether. I was able to sign there. I was able to communicate. And you'll see that later on in the slide as well. But I didn't want to go back to school. I told my family I was going to quit. And I told them the reasons why that I didn't want to be there. And they had said that you no longer have to live with your foster family anymore, that you could live with your sister, with your oldest sister. And that changed things for me. 
It was living with the foster family that I didn't want to go to. Being part of the Manitoba School for the Deaf is where I wanted to be. And I was able to live there for three years with her. And at a point in time, you know, my sister had said, Emil, you know, you're learning sign language, you know, and I, I was teaching her sign language and she'd finger spell with me so we could communicate back and forth. And it was, it was a slow, slow learning curve for her, but she was willing to do it. And then seven, eight, nine months later, my sister ended up getting sick again. She ended up getting skin cancer. She was only 30 at that time. I was only 14 or 15. And I couldn't believe it. Another part in my life. And she just deteriorated in front of my eyes. And I had just taught her all this when we were building this connection. And February 7th, 1986, she ended up passing away. And I was torn. I ended up going back to Easterville. I ended up quitting school. I wasn't going to go back to a foster family again. I wasn't willing to do that. And they had said, you need to go back to school again. And I said, no, I'm not. No, I, I'm owed the time here in Easterville. I want my time here. And they encouraged me to continue to go back to school. And they said, you need to go back. You need to be a part of that. And at some point in time, I agreed. I ended up getting on the bus again. But nobody told me that I'd be living in the dorm at that time at the Manitoba School for the Deaf. And that experience was different. I accepted that experience. I was able to travel back and forth on the weekends and see my family. I was able to see them on the spring breaks and the Christmas holidays. I was able to see them. So that made my experience that much better. And again, thanks to Grey Goose Bus Line, who is willing to do that for me. Next slide. So now when we talk about breaking through, and I look at, and you see this slide, and it says MPI, and you think, well, deaf people can't drive. And you may see deaf people driving now, but in the past, that wasn't always the case. Of course, I had to practice. I had to have somebody teach me. Signe Badger, who's sitting right over there, graciously, graciously took on that role and, and helped me go through the course and learn to drive, and I ended up passing and getting my license. And for 35 years now, I have been driving. But I know that there are other countries out there who still do not allow individuals who are deaf to drive. That's still to this day, 2023, we're still going through that. But we don't have that here anymore. Next slide. Even hunting. People thinking that deaf people cannot hunt. And of course we can. So I ended up going to a class and getting my training and doing all the work that needed to be done in order to get my hunting license. And I ended up passing that and was able to do all the right things and get certified, get my license so that I could again hunt. And of course, people on the community even thought, on the reserve thought, wow, you're deaf and you're going to hunt. I'm not quite sure if that's safe. And I showed them my license and I'm like, of course I can. Of course I can. And yes, it was 22 caliber, but of, of course I can hunt. Next slide. So you might be wondering why midwife would be up there. And I wasn't expecting this either. But when I married Barbara, we had home birth. And the two of us had argued. And I had said, no, we need to go to the hospital. We need to trust in the doctors. And we need to trust in the science and and do what they're doing there. And she said, absolutely not. We are staying home. I'm going to have a midwife, and that will be you, Easter, Emil, and you will help deliver your children. And I was like, okay. Okay, I was thinking about, you know, I'm wanting them to be healthy. I'm, I'm thinking that maybe the hospital would be the best place to go. And, you know, we, insurance was an issue at that time. And, and as the time got closer, and she started having contractions, and I was there, and I was like, no, you know what? Maybe we need to wait. You know, maybe we need to wait until the actual midwife could get here because we were, I was just training and I was thinking, oh my goodness, this is going to be the same thing, right? I mean, it's like having a bowel movement, isn't it? It's, it's, it's just the same thing. It's, it's as easy as that. I thought I could do this. I've had them. So I was trying to figure it out and I was saying, okay, push, push. 
here, breathe, breathe, watch me. Okay, this is how we're going to do it. And, and sure enough, I couldn't believe it. We had a girl. I was holding a girl in my hands and I was like, look at this, look at this. And I gave Barbara the baby and we delivered the placenta and, and it was, it was an amazing experience. And you could see she was just kind of moving around and she was a 10 pound baby. I just delivered a 10 pound baby and I was in shock. Well, I mean, I didn't deliver it. I helped deliver it, but there was no tearing. There was no surgery. There was nothing like that. My heart was racing and we did it. We did it. I was like, this is a miracle. And then two hours later, the midwife who had been working with me arrived and I said, oh no, we've already done this. And they said, you did it. You did it. So you have that. You can do it now. You can be, and I didn't have a license at that time. I didn't study. I didn't go to university for that. I didn't know how to be a midwife for the midwifery process, but I did. And I was like, hey, wow, look at me. Hey, look at this hot stuff over here. I can do it. This is great. They told me I did a good job. And I was, I was shocked. I, 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 I was able to help out. And we ended up going to Finland and we spent three years in Finland and we had ended up having our fourth and fifth child in Finland as well. And I, again, took on that role as a midwife. And then the doctor came. Of course, there was a, a doctor who would come and just make sure that they would take care. And they walked in and their jaw hit the floor and they couldn't believe. And they said, I, I had asked them, I said, are you okay? And they looked at me and they pointed and they said, did, did, did you deliver this baby? And I said, yeah, look at this guy. Hey, this is my... It's not my first rodeo. Let's go. I've done this before. And they said, well, you've done a great job. And he was thinking, well, he's so educated and he has this degree and he can do this. And of course you need a doctor there. And I was like, degree or not, I was able to do it. I was able to deliver another child. So now if you are pregnant out there, I am advertising today. I will be your midwife. I'm joking. I am joking. <laughs> Next slide, please. So now if we're talking about things that deaf people can do, and I've mentioned several of them, get their license, hunting. Uh, again, it's not just for people who are hearing or non-deaf or hard of hearing. It doesn't matter. These are things that anybody can do. So I can cook. Right? I can do a number of things. I can fix things. Right? I can go to Easterville in the community and people come up to me and have said to me, why don't you become chief? Why don't you become chief? We would vote for you. And I had thought about it. I thought about it. Could a deaf person become a chief? And I'm like, of course they can. But how do I communicate with the people on the land there? How do I communicate with them? Would I have to have an interpreter? Would then the community have to pay for the interpreting cost? Right, And of course, here we have the interpreters with us today, and it makes it easy for us to communicate. But up there, we would have that barrier. That would be the barrier, would be communicating. But could I become chief? Yes, I could. And I believe the next slide, please, might be the YouTube video. Hello. That's it. I'm Don Philpott, Professor of Teacher Education at Shippensburg University in South Central Pennsylvania. I'd like to share a few thoughts with you about my good friend, Emil Easter, who will speak to you shortly. I met Emil in the summer of 1979 in his hometown of Easterville. I was a first year university student at the time, employed for the summer by the Chimawan Chief and Council as a recreation worker. I met lots of people with the last name of Easter that summer and soon learned that the community of Easterville was named after Amos' late grandfather, Donald Easter. Amos' grandfather played a key role in the resettlement of the Chimuan people in the early 1960s. Amos and I have now been friends for almost 44 years and enjoy spending time with each other whenever we can. I moved from Manitoba to Pennsylvania 12 years ago to teach literacy and literature courses at the State University in Chippensburg. In 2019, during my yearly summer visit home to Manitoba, Emil showed me around his office building, the Manitoba First Nations Education Resource Center, and he introduced me to some of his colleagues. 
My interests in Indigenous education and deaf education are long-standing, and I was extremely interested to hear about Emil's role at the Resource Centre and the support he provides for deaf Indigenous young people throughout Northern Manitoba. By the summer of 1979, when I, when I met Emil in Easterville, I had been using American Sign Language, ASL, for about two years. I learned signs mainly from deaf people, but also by reading and studying several excellent sign language books. By 1979, I was very comfortable communicating with young people like Emil using signs and simple sentences. And you know, when I met uh, Emil for the first time, he was eight years old. And by that time, he had already been attending school in Winnipeg for two years. I vividly recall meeting Emil for the first time that summer. He rode through the schoolyard on his bicycle, stopped in front of my teacherage, and stared at me curiously. One of his cousins spotted him close to me and called out, that's him, he's the one I told you about. I signed to Emil right away. Hello, are you deaf? My name is Dawn. I'm hearing. Nice bike. Throughout that first summer, I visited Emil often at his house until his family left by boat for their summer fishing camp across the lake. His parents, Wilson and Nora, were very kind to me. I visited Emil in his living room in Easterville many times. His parents, siblings and relatives always gathered in the living room with us, and I gladly shared some of our conversation with them. I vividly recall how pleased they were that someone could communicate with Emil and that I could interpret for them. Wilson didn't talk very much during those visits, but he listened closely. Nora liked to joke around and tease me. Right from the start, she was like that. She was very skilled at English. I have many fond memories of his parents. Wilson and Nora always made me feel welcome and comfortable in their home. I returned to Easterville several times that fall in 1979, then moved permanently to Easterville in the new year to live with the George family, the late uh, McLeod and Alice George, as their adopted son. Amos spent his Christmas and summer holidays with his family in Easterville, but for most of the school year, starting at age six, he was billeted with a family in Winnipeg. His parents, Wilson and Nora, gave me permission to visit him in the city and take him on outings. Emil has a better memory of these outings than I do. He recalls me taking him snaring and swimming and traveling home with him to Easterville on the Grey Goose bus. It fills me with joy and pride to share my memories and thoughts with you about Emil Easter. Emil has always updated me on new events in his life his graduation from Manitoba School for the Deaf in Winnipeg in the early 1990s, his post-secondary coursework in the United States, his marriage, his children, his family life, his travels home to Easterville, and his unique experiences and successes as a Cree man who is deaf. I'm indebted to Emil for our long friendship for over 40 years. He has taught me many things nobody else has his unique life experiences, his wonderful personality, his loving and accepting nature, his great sense of humor, no doubt um, uh, given to him, bequeathed to him by his mother. And of course, his talents, his many talents make him an extraordinary person in my mind, uh, an excellent friend and role model, a heroic person. I'm so grateful that he steered his bike into the schoolyard that day back in the summer of 1979. My life is richer knowing him and learning from him. Thank you. Anytime I hear that, I feel very overwhelmed. It's, uh, it's great to look back uh, and see that relationship that Don and I have had throughout those years and I had asked them to move to Manitoba and, and, or even come here and be a part of this conference. Um, it's just unfortunate that he wasn't able to do it, but uh, 
you know, he, he spent those years learning sign language, communicating with me and spent the time in the, in Easterville and learning off the land uh, from indigenous people. So I was very impressed, just a great human being. Uh, next slide. So I, I use this image because we're talking about breaking through and I was trying to think of, you know, what does it look like to break through for us uh, to excellence? And I think within our communities, uh, we need to think about how we can do that. And we all have those, those skill sets, those gifts within us. And I know that we think that we can't do things, but we can. We can absolutely take those ideas, break through those walls, and be successful. Next slide. So when I think about my experience and how it, how it has affected me uh, for me to move forward and do things, and I think about communication being so important. And I think it's important to continue to contact those communities that we reach out to, making sure that they have access to language, that we empower them, that we give them the skill sets so that they can become successful and breakthrough as well. As well. We need to give them not only the, you know, signing skills, but the literacy skills as well. We need them to become bilingual, bicultural, to become successful. Next slide. And yes, of course, I am so proud of the work that I and we are doing at the MFNERC. I've been there now for the last six years. The time has flown by. It's been an amazing experience to go out to these schools, to these reserves and provide them with services to help them continue to move forward and keeping the students uh, and the EAs and individuals within the communities and giving them the opportunity to learn sign and to grow as a community. And I've gone throughout a number of communities and when I come back, it is exhausting. It's exhausting because of what I see while I'm out there and I need to come here to re-energize myself, to come back out there to do the work, the good work that we need to do for the communities and we need to continue to do that. Next slide. And of course there are challenges right now. There's a number of challenges that we see every time that we head out. So within the communities, it's, it's different now than it was before, but we are now moving out into the communities and it's starting to take over and they're growing and, and, and it's great. And sign language is, be, is more relevant now in these communities as well and communication is able to happen. For individuals who are deaf, we are giving them laptops and iPads and so we can communicate with them virtually as well. So they have more exposure so we're doing it through MS Teams, we're doing it through Zooms, and so we have this opportunity to continue to communicate so it's not just once or twice a year where we get to go out there. We do this weekly now where we get to have these conversations with them. We schedule them in so we can continue to develop their language. Next slide. So I believe that as we move forward with our EAs, our resources, our schools, our parents, family members, the community itself, we need to continue to support them. We need to continue to provide one-on-one -on -one support. We need to make sure that we're doing some education, uh, reach out to the communities, think about their future and let them think about their future and let them know that they can do whatever they want, that they have the skill sets, that they shouldn't be limited into their, in what their thoughts and ideas and dreams are that if they want to go to university and colleges, that they should be going to university and colleges. We need to make sure that they have that mindset and let them know. I think it's important that we need to continue to work on it, that they have that faith. We can't just be ending the work that we're doing, but it needs to continue. I want to encourage you all that to have that goal, that to think of their futures. Don't think about just right now. Think about what their dreams are. Let them know that it can come true. That if they put the work in, that if they work hard and that we support them, that they can do whatever they want. 
that they have a bright future, that we don't need to ignore them, that they don't need to quit, that they can't do, because I did. I gave up. I quit two times, but I continued on, and I was able to make it. And here I am, and I'm, I feel like this is a dream, and that they have those dreams too, and we need to provide them with those tools and those skills so that they can do it. Next slide. I like this illustration because when everybody else is talking in the room and I don't have an interpreter with me, then I don't understand what's going on. But it's the same for you. If I'm talking with somebody and you're standing beside me, then you may not understand what's going on others. So this is just something to think about moving forward. Next slide. So how many languages or different versions of sign language are around the world? No. 3,000, oh, wouldn't that be nice? Oh man, that's a dream. No, it's less than that, but that would be amazing. Any other guesses? Scream them out, yell them out. <laughs> 10, no, if we go on to the next slide, let's see. There are 300 different forms of sign language around the world globally. ASL, American Sign Language, isn't used around the world, as you may think, right? It's not international, right? There are different sign languages around the world. So if you think about different languages, spoken language, we may have that. Within Manitoba, we have five different languages that we use. Spoken language and sign language, we have a number of, uh, of sign languages across Canada as well. And so if you think about the world, we have thousands of languages and 300 sign languages. And my wife, when I first met her as well, she was speaking Finnish sign language, right? And so she would use different facial expressions, right? And I would have to figure that out. We would have to learn and communicate with each other. But she already, of course, knows two or three or four different languages where she can move through smoothly, which I can too. But that's how we first met. Next slide. And just again, thinking about, and don't move forward just yet on the next slide, just wait. Just thinking about how deaf people can overcome communication barriers. I want you to give that a thought. Next slide. So avoid talking too rapidly or using complex or too, compl too complicated sign, uh, sentences. Next, in English, of course. Keep your hands away from your face when you're speaking because if we're trying to see your facial expressions or if we're trying to read your lips, then we may not be able to understand or see what you're saying. So please make sure that you are not covering your mouth, and if you are communicating, making sure that we're not creating barriers for people who are signing. So because sign language is a visual language, and so we need to see all those, those things in order to make sure that we can have that conversation. That's just part of the deaf culture way. And of course, I can't hear, so I can see double what I've lost in hearing with my eyes. Next slide. And so what are some of the barriers that deaf individuals face? Next. So we have lack of access to language or even assistive devices. So that would be hearing aids, for example, FM systems that we may use in the classroom. Next. So quite often, Deaf children are delayed in receiving a language as well because it's identified late. And so they don't have that access to language. And especially if individuals who are less fortunate than others or aren't as wealthy, they may not be able to afford the hearing aids, the iPads in order to assist in some of that language development. Next.
So again, it's important that we remove these barriers. Next slide. It's important to remove these barriers in order for us to, you know, take away this distorted message that we're receiving, that we're not communicating clearly. There are these barriers that are preventing it from being clear so that we can communicate so that it's easy, so that there aren't misunderstandings. And misunderstandings happen quite often as well. And so I think it's important. And yes, of course, it's nice to have the interpreters in the room. And yes, it's nice that we are able to communicate clearly this way. And of course, that is a way to take away a barrier and take away miscommunication, misunderstandings. But that's just one way. Next. You may be wondering what those things are on the screen as well. Oh, if we go back one slide. Yeah, there we go. Leave it there just for a second. So you may be wondering what some of these screens are. The one that's a circular one there is actually a bed shaker. So if you ever wonder how deaf people wake up in the morning, we have something placed under our pillow that will vibrate and shake when our phone goes off, so or our alarm clock goes off, so it alerts that vibrator, vibrator underneath, the bed, uh, underneath the pillow. The second one, again, is that alarm clock attached to it. And there is a flashing light that you can have. But again, if you see a flashing light, that may be that somebody is at the door because we won't hear them knocking. So if they ring the doorbell, we have a flashing light that goes off. And again, these are just some things to think about in order to help individuals maybe within your community set these up. But we depend on these technologies. And there's a baby alarm as well. You may be able to see that on the screen as well. So that if we do have children, and of course we had six children, and you're wondering how we know if a baby is crying overnight, of course we're sleeping and we wouldn't hear them crying and they would just be crying throughout the night and we'd have a great sleep. But that's not the case. We don't want to leave our babies unattended. So what ends up happening is, again, one time when Barbara had a child and we had our baby and I just said, well, how are we going to work this throughout the night? And my mother-in-law actually spent time with us and while we slept at one or two o'clock in the morning, she would be our baby alarm. She would come and let us know that we needed to wake up to feed the baby, to change the baby's diaper, to rock the baby. So she would be our alarm letting us know and then putting the baby back down again. And as soon as you get into bed, of course, just like everybody else, you know that the light or the alarm or, you know, your mother-in-law is going to tap you on the shoulder again and it's time to get back up again and take care. And of course, at that time, we were starting to go to university and we were exhausted at that time because the babies just wouldn't be sleeping throughout the night and trying to write our papers and get our assignments done and get through our exams. And it was a challenge. But, you know, here we, the, the assistive technology is crucial for us, right? We didn't want to have CFS come into our home and take our children away. So we needed these things in order to become successful parents. And so we've had six children. They are all successful as well, and they've all grown up. And of course, with you being hearing and non-deaf individuals, it's so much easier for you because you can just hear your child crying overnight. So we have to find ways to be creative in order to do that. Next slide. I have this image up here only because if you think about people who are deaf, they're not going to hear you honking. I remember going to MFNERC office one day and I was packing some things away and I think it was four or five o'clock and I was walking out and going to my car and putting things in my car. And as I was coming back into the building, somehow my boss came up to me and they said, hey, I was trying to get your attention email. I was honking, but you just ignored me and you didn't even pay attention. You just kept walking right past me. And then as he was saying that, he realized, oh, my Emil is deaf. Why would I have honked my horn? I, he was honking his horn apparently in the parking lot at this guy who was completely ignoring him. And just I had just walked right on by. So I thought that was pretty, pretty funny at the time. Uh, next slide. Just so wanted to introduce you, so stay on this slide for a second. I wanted to introduce you to some of my favorite dons in the world. Uh, so these are the, you know, the dons that I've met over the years who have uh, impressed me, who have worked with me, who have supported me. And
And so Don and I, we've spoke a lot of in the community. Uh, and again, that's Don Philpot, Don Robertson, who is an elder. Uh, him and I have had great conversations, of course, with interpreters. Uh, I've been able to sit down with him, uh, tell him about the, the years that I've had, the traveling opportunities that I've had with MFNERC. There's been moments of stress, moments where I felt like I wanted to give up, where I wanted to stop, where I didn't think I could continue on, where it was too overwhelming, too draining. And Don sat me down and he said that, no, you are in the place where you need to be and the Northern community needs you and they want you to continue to do the work. You're an indigenous deaf man and there is an indigenous deaf people up there. And so that through that counseling from Don and that support from uh, Elder Don as well, that has helped me to continue the good work that I'm doing right now because I need to not focus on myself, but focus on the education and focus on the kids and the families and the communities up north, because it's easy to sometimes want to give up because you don't have that energy. But it's, it's, it's emotional to see that in those communities and they need the workers and they need us to go up there and do that work. So I have continued on. And then of course, Don Shackle, who is, yes, he's my boss, um, but him and I have worked so closely together and we've worked well together. And again, he's one of those who have spoken to me and told me that I need to continue to stay and do the good work. So these are my, my favorite Dons. So if you ever see them, uh, they're, they're great individuals and they're, they're, they've been a huge support for me and in my work and in my life. And uh, I'm sure that within the communities up north as well and, and throughout Manitoba. So now I just want to take a minute. I, I was thinking, you know, within your communities, if there is anybody who has hearing loss, um, hard of hearing, uh, who isn't able to communicate through speech, who is deaf, you know, if you have a child who is born deaf, please, I, I don't want anybody to be depressed. I don't want anybody to, to be upset or feel ashamed or think that the creator has, you know, done this to, to me or my family, it's not the truth. There's, there's no punishment out there. It's just like me. So if you see a child who is born deaf in your community, just think about their future, that they can be an individual like me as well, right? And out of my family, there were 11 of us and I was the only one who is deaf. There's 10 hearing and one deaf. But of course, you know, I was able to, to communicate with my family. They didn't throw me out of the family. They didn't oust me. They didn't take me out of the community. They were able to work with me, but I was able to do all those things again, marry, have children, become successful in the future. So if you have a deaf child or a hard of hearing child, don't be disparaged. Be accepting of them. There's opportunities out there. There are schools, there are resources out there. So please seek them out. And again, don't worry about that. Don't feel like you're stuck. Don't feel like you're alone. There are ways to break through. That's why we're here today to talk about those breakthrough moments. So if you need somebody, if you need to contact, you are able to contact me. Next slide. And you're not only able to contact me, but you have contacts within, within MFNERC. You can contact Mary Lou, you can contact Signe. We were definitely willing to work with you and support you in your communities. And if you move on to the next slide, you'll see another great group of individuals who are the ASL support team. And we will come out to your communities, just be in contact with us. We will work with your resource team, with your education team, with the children, we will send people into the community. Again, we're not gonna force anybody to do anything they don't want to do, but we wanna make sure that there's opportunities for them to become successful. The children within your communities, individuals within your communities who are deaf and hard of hearing, I don't want to see them being eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old, because at that time it's so challenging to work on having them learn sign language. So if we can start that now at the age of two, 
Three, it's so much easier. They're going to be so much more successful. Their minds will grow. The language development will happen. They will be successful moving forward. They're going to have opportunities to get work. They will have all those skill sets needed to do all those things. So get in touch with this group of people. If you ever want to hear any more stories, if you ever have any questions, if you ever want to speak, please come up to us, email us, email us at MFNERC. We are looking forward to supporting you within the deaf and hard of cheering team. And so that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for inviting me here today. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I've made this breakthrough. We are all able to make this breakthrough. And so for deaf people, if you want to clap for me, raise your hands. Shake your hands in the air. We do it visually. This is how we clap. It is silent, but it is how we see your applause. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. And thank you to Michael as well, Hutchinson, for allowing me to come out here and support me and giving me this opportunity. I really, really am thankful. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you. That was such a good, uh, engaging talk today. And uh, and um, <clears throat> you know, I was uh, thinking about something, and a friend, a coworker, brought up uh, an interesting fact. Did you know American Sign Language, behind Chinese, Spanish, and English, is the fourth most popular language in America. Isn't that interesting? There's a lot, a lot of speakers of American Sign Language out there. So that's, we learn, I think uh, I speak for everybody. We learned a lot today. And I really enjoyed that, that part about the midwife. And I'll keep you in mind if, uh, if, I, if I ever need to give you a call. <laughs> but uh, that was a very entertaining talk and it was a pleasure. <laughs> he's, he's retired, he says. <laughs> yeah. So I, I forgot to mention one thing as well. Um, again, uh, we do have American Sign Language. We do have LSQ. And we do have ISL as well, Indigenous Sign Language. So I think it's important for everybody to know that those are the three languages that we use in Canada. Well, that's very interesting. So again, thank you for your talk today. Uh, we have not very much time to get to our session. So let's get to our next groups where you want to go. And we shall reconvene here at 12 o'clock for a quick prayer and to uh, introduce our noon hour entertainment. So we'll see you here at uh, lunchtime. Thank you. Thank you.